Isn't it about time we looked again at how we deal with behaviour incidents in school? Because one thing has always bothered me. Why in so many secondary schools up and down the country do we have our most expensive human resource, our senior leadership teams in secondary schools, patrolling the corridors with a walkie-talkie in hand to sort out behaviour incidents? Number one, how has an incident got so bad that somebody else has to come for backup? And number two, why is it only the senior leadership team who can sort out those issues? And it raises the question, what if we could create a system where those behaviour incidents didn't happen in the first place? Just think about it. No isolation, no exclusions, no detentions. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And for people who do the patrols currently, not to have to do them anymore, because I was that senior leader. In one school, I did 22 hours of patrol every single week. 22 hours where I should have been doing strategic work and leading the school and thinking of the strategic direction of the school. How can that be right? How can that be a good use of school funds and a good use of my time? And it certainly did not do my mental health or well-being any good. So, about three years ago, my vice principal and I decided to have a look at exclusions data and behaviour data. We had a really good, honest look, and it made uncomfortable reading. Those who were most in need of our help, those who were vulnerable, those who had mental health and well-being issues, they were the ones that we were excluding. They were the ones that were being put into detention. Those were the ones who were being put in isolation. And every single time we did that, we were making them feel more and more rejected, more that they didn't be, belong to our school and part of our community. And what happened was they stopped coming to school because school was just a horrible place to be in. Now, nobody in my school wanted that to happen. Everybody goes into the teaching profession to make a difference, to make sure that every single child, no matter what their needs, backgrounds or abilities, is able to succeed. But we really needed to look at what we were doing again and starting from scratch and making sure that we had a structure in the school that would enable those students to thrive and enable our staff to thrive. Now, our structure was typical of a secondary school of over a thousand students. We had the head teacher, me, a couple of deputy head teachers, and some assistant head teachers. And below that, we had some middle leaders, heads of houses. And around 260 students would belong to that one head of house. But the issue was that head of house had a very heavy teaching timetable. Now, they did have a support member of staff, the student manager, but the problem was, if the head of house was teaching and then the support manager was off sick or they were in a meeting, if a child had an issue and they needed that dealt with immediately, quite often there was nobody in that office. And not only that, our four heads of house and our four student managers all shared an office together eight members of staff, and it became a negative hive of energy because all they were dealing with were poor behaviour incidents. Poor behaviour incidents because things weren't being addressed in the first place. What we needed to do was address the mental health and wellbeing needs of those students, catching them before they fell, rather than being reactive right at the end and punishing them when they did fall. So, let's have a think. What about we create a system where there are different hubs in the school? So for a school of over a thousand children, let's say three hubs. And in those hubs, we have three support members of staff, three members of staff who do not have a teaching timetable, three members of staff who will always be there if those students are in need of someone to talk to or they need to share something that happened the night before. Because when there's three people, the lines for communication drastically reduce. With three people, there's only three lines of communication, which ensures that none of that communication gets lost. And because they are in their own hub, that communication always stays within that hub and the students know exactly where to go. Whereas before, in a system where we had eight members of staff sharing a room together, there were 28 lines of communication. 
And if that student couldn't speak to the person that they needed to speak to, they'd speak to someone else. And that's only if they remembered to pass on the message would whatever that issue was be dealt with. 28 lines of communication. And by the time you add the six members of SLT, senior leaders, into the mix and you have 14 people, well, that now becomes 91 lines of communication or 91 times that communication can be lost or 91 times something can go wrong. So we really needed to look at the structure and we created these three hubs and what's also been fantastic is that it's encouraged healthy competition because let's all face it, we all have different gifts and different talents and all of those things need to be celebrated. So we don't just have sports days, we also celebrate literacy, we celebrate arts, we celebrate science, we celebrate maths, history, geography and there are competitions where all students and all of their talents talents are celebrated and recognised. And let's have a think about our special educational needs and how we cater for those students. I'm passionate about inclusive education. I strongly feel that everybody should be part of their community and part of society. So why is it in so many schools you have units where students with special educational needs stay and they never integrate with the rest of the school? And not only that, they have a teaching assistant that's constantly attached to them because let's face it, when we had a good look at what our teaching assistants were doing. Actually, what was happening was they were doing the work for the child. They were answering questions for them. How was that going to enable that child to become an independent person when they leave school? What was it doing to their self-esteem and their confidence when what we were telling them was, you're only good enough to be segregated and put in this unit? And what about behaviour reflection units? There are many schools out there that have these behaviour reflection units. When students misbehave, they go in there. And out of sight, out of mind, we don't need to think about them anymore. Surely that can't be right, because if we have that good, honest look about who these children are, actually they're the ones that need our love, support and guidance the most. So... Why don't we rebrand our behaviour reflection units and call them wellbeing centres or reflection centres where students can self-refer so that if they're not feeling themselves or something has happened the night before or they've experienced some trauma, they can go there and they can speak to members of staff who have been trained in mental health first aid, emotional literacy support, and they can talk to them because sometimes that is all that's needed, a little chat someone to understand what they're going through. And not only that, why don't we have some well-being mentors, student well-being mentors, perhaps those who want to go into counselling or psychology later on? Why don't we train them up and work with health professionals so that they can build up their skills, but they can also help their peers. Because let's face it, sometimes it can be really tricky and really scary for a young person to go to an adult and ask them for help. But actually, if they can speak to a peer, somebody who's the same age as them, that person can give them the confidence to go and speak and seek help. And all of those things that I've spoken about today are things that we've done at my school, Burton Borough School in Shropshire. And not only that, one thing that we know is if we want our students to have excellent mental health and well-being, we need to ensure that our staff have excellent mental health and well-being too. So together, as a staff group, we decided no emails after 5.30. And if you absolutely feel the need to send an email after 5.30, please do not expect a response until the next working day, because everybody has a family at home and everybody needs to get away from work and clear their mind if they are to stay mentally healthy. We scrapped lesson observations, we scrapped learning walks. Why? Because in the two weeks where people or SLT were going to go and watch teachers teach, the conversation in the staff room would be, have you been seen yet? Have you been seen yet? Instead of pedagogy and learning. And that's not what we wanted. 
So we do drop into each other's lessons now, but purely on a professional development basis. And after every lesson, teachers will get together and talk about the lesson and say what went well, what they're going to take and use in their own lessons. And that's been a much more productive way in sharing what we do and sharing good practice. And not only that, we've changed the culture so much now that people get disappointed if SLT don't come into their lessons to have a look at the good work that their children are doing. And in terms of marking, well, we've scrapped the eight hour marking policy because what's the point in a student getting a piece of marking eight hours after they've done the piece of work? We do live feedback, so the marking and the feedback happens there and then straight away. Now, everything I've spoken about today isn't just something that can be replicated in loads of different schools. Yes, our exclusions have gone down. We used to have over 100 exclusions every single academic year, and we're pretty much down to single figures now. And our behavior incidents have plummeted. And not only that, we saved 175,000 pounds by looking again at our structure and doing things differently. But each school is different, and each school will need its own unique structure. So what I am hoping from my talk today is that you will look again at what your schools are doing and what your organisations are doing and challenge the status quo. Does it support mental health and well-being? Because at the end of the day, isn't an organisation or a school where everybody feels trusted, supported and happy and less emotionally strained an organisation that we would all like to work in? Thank you very much.